The, um, there were a couple of versions of the policy in Kitzmiller versus Dover that um, were involved in the lawsuit, but the simplified version of the lawsuit of the policy passed in Dover had two components. Um, students will be made aware of gaps slash problems of Darwin's theory and be introduced to intelligent design. Uh, the lawyer for the plaintiffs there, uh, Eric Rothschild, is holding a copy of Pandas and People, which was a book proposed for use in the Dover public school system. Now, uh, NCSC, the organization that I work for, did work with the plaintiff's legal team, and we helped to select the expert witnesses and assisted throughout the trial. Our expert witnesses consisted of, uh, first of all, two scientists, Ken Miller and Kevin Padium, who were our first and last witnesses. We started and ended with scientists. We bookended our expert witnesses. Actually, we bookended all of our witnesses. We had fact witnesses scattered among the expert witnesses, of course. But we bookended the trial with scientists because we wanted to signal to the judge that we wanted him to look at the science. We, we didn't want this to be a trial just on was there a religious purpose for passing this policy? We had a pretty good reason to imagine that that would be the case, that the judge would agree, because there was plenty of paper trail showing that the school board members did want to advance religion in this case. But we didn't want to go over the same thing six months later with a smarter school board, so we wanted the trial to be on this set of facts. So we really, really encouraged the judge, and we made science a big part of our presentation of the plaintiff's case. Ken Miller uh, and Kevin Padian were our two scientists. We also had the philosopher of science, Robert Pinnock, the theologian, Jack Haught from Georgetown University, historian of, well, actually philosopher of science, but in a role of his historian of intelligent design, Barbara Forrest, author of the wonderful book, uh, Creationism's Trojan Horse, and an education expert, Brian Alters from McGill University, who would be able to address the pedagogical arguments that we had to bring up. So what was our position? Well, we of course wanted the, to convince the judge that intelligent design was religion, uh, that there was no secular reason for teaching intelligent design. I'm delighted that um, Eddie mentioned that that is the real criterion for deciding whether uh, a, a bill or a law is unconstitutional. If there's a secular reason for, if you're feeding the kids because there's a good secular reason to not have hungry children, just because religious people say it's a good thing to feed kids doesn't mean you stop feeding kids. But if there's no valid secular reason for teaching intelligent, intelligent design, then there's only religious reasons for teaching it and it fails. And so that is the point that we had to make. And to demonstrate to the judge that indeed there was no valid secular reason for teaching intelligent design, we had to show the judge that intelligent design was not science, that its claims were false, and that in fact it did not follow the quote rules of science in the sense that it was going about science in a very idiosyncratic way that was not recognized by the practitioners of the craft. And we also had to show, or wanted to show, that evolution is a very solid science, because we knew evolution was going to be attacked on the other side. So we also had to um, try to blunt what we correctly predicted would be the attack on the other side. Now the plaintiffs, oh, excuse me, and indeed as this cartoon from the New Yorker says, uh, for six weeks the courtroom of Judge John Jones III was like the biology class you wish you could have taken. <laughs> I, I don't know how many times a slide of the bacteria flagellum was shown. <laughs> but after, uh, after several witnesses at one point, um, it was actually a defense witness that was on the stand, and the same slide of the flagellum came up. And he said, uh, you know, he said, well, I guess this is familiar. And the judge said, we've seen this before. <laughs> But the defense ex expert witnesses included Scott Minnick from the University of Idaho, who's a biochemist, the aforementioned William Dembski, a philosopher of science and mathematician, Michael Behe, author of Darwin's Black Box, John Angus Campbell, who's at North Carolina, uh, University of North Carolina, he's a historian of science. The, uh, um, John Angus Campbell, who is a rhetorician, really interesting man in many respects, 
Um, Stephen Fuller, who is an American teaching at um, a British university, uh, Birmingham, I think it is. Is that right? Some, some familiar? I should know. Um, and he is also a philosopher of science. And an educator, uh, sorry, uh, Stephen Meyer from the Discovery Institute, another philosopher of science. And Dick Carpenter, whom really none of us had heard about. He was truly the new kid on the block. And he was their education specialist. Now, what was their job? The defense had to defend the secular pedagogical value of teaching intelligent design. If they admitted, well, of course, it was a religion, they couldn't deny that, but they had to argue, like Eddie says, that there was a good secular reason for teaching it, and the way good secular reasons is, of course, that ideas fell in science. This is cutting-edge stuff that students would benefit from learning. And that the that evolution really is questionable science, referring, of course, to that gaps slash problems and evolution component of the policy. Um, so that is what they were going to try to do. And um, there were, of course, fact witnesses as well. There were uh, plaintiffs. There were members of the school board. And uh, we didn't win this case just <laughs> on the science. Uh, there were school board members who were making some quite outrageous statements, like uh, this gentleman. Uh, in a school board member he's, the meeting, he said, 2,000 years ago someone died on a cross. Can't someone take a stand for him? And then, of course, denied saying it, and also denied that it had anything to do with a religious purpose for teaching intelligence. <laughs> uh, it, it, in one sense, we could probably have won this case on the venality of school board members alone. Uh, because there was truly a wonderful... It, this, may I just say, just because I talk a lot about legal stuff, but we don't want to sue anybody. The, the last thing you want to do is go to court. Sorry, Eddie, you're alone. Um, but the last thing, you want to solve these problems off stage, out of the light of publicity, you will never hear about probably 80% of the issues NCSC is involved in because we solve these problems off stage. We, we solve them quietly without the press becoming involved, certainly without uh, lawsuits. Lawsuits are expensive, they're exhausting, they're really exhausting. Um, they take time away from things that could be done you know, more productive ways of, of uh, improving science education. You don't sue if you don't absolutely have to. And actually, the, the citizens in this community worked very, very hard for months to try to turn the school board members around, and the members were just recalcitrant. The only recourse that the citizens of Dover had was to sue. That said, this was the perfect case. <laughs> we were very, very happy to have the Kitzmiller versus Dover case to test intelligent design because you had school board members like this who made these outrageous statements and clearly demonstrated the religious purpose. Plus, they lied. Um, they lied in their depositions, they lied on the stand, and judges are really picky about that. Uh, one school board member uh, claimed that he had no idea where the money for the um, to purchase the Pandas and People books came from. It came out that he had passed the hat at his church, and in the process of, of discovery in the case, the check that he wrote to the school board member to pay for the books with his signature on it came up, and it was sort of a, I forgot that. But, when the um, case uh, uh, actually went to court, or I should say before the case went to court, there's many, many months of preparation, depositions of witnesses and plaintiffs and, and defense and all, lots of stuff has to go on. We were uh, preparing to um, depose uh, John Angus Campbell. Uh, the lawyers were there at the office in Tennessee where Campbell was living at the time. 